It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. we got a great panel. Lou M.M. is here. Lou Maresca from This Week in Enterprise Tech. The Technologizer, Harry McCracken from Fast Company. And from a brand new publication, you remember her from Wired Magazine, Louise Metsakis will talk about Semaphore, her new job, and Elon Musk. He's got five days to make a deal with Twitter. Uh, and then he says he's going to fire almost everybody. We'll talk about the artist who's burning all his paintings if you just buy an NFT. And is the iPad strategy making any sense at all? All that and a whole lot more coming up next on Twit. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Twit. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 898, recorded Sunday, October 23rd, 2022. The Alphabetical Show. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Audible. Audible lets you enjoy all of your audio entertainment in one app. Let Audible help you discover new ways to laugh, be inspired, or be entertained. New members can try it free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash twit or text twit to 500-500. And by ZipRecruiter. There are so many podcasts out right now, and it takes a team of people to bring them together. Whether you're hiring for a podcast or for your growing business, one place makes it easy. ZipRecruiter. And now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. And by Shopify. Millions of the world's most successful brands trust Shopify to sell, ship, and process payments anywhere. Go to shopify.com slash twit, all lowercase, to start selling online today and sign up for a free trial. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we cover the week's tech news. I have assembled for your delectation and pleasure a wonderful panel, starting with the technologizer himself, Harry McCracken. Hi, Harry. Hey, Leo. Global technology editor at Fast Company. And I always think of you as our archivist because you are keeping uh, vintage technology alive. And I love that. I'm trying. Although a lot of the stuff I'm sharing, I don't actually own. I just find it on the Internet. But it, but it is fun. Uh, People seem to love it. Yeah. I, uh, I got uh, just on Wednesday, Jerry and I drove up uh, to visit uh, the guy who was the executive producer for the site on MSNBC which was, I think, the first daily network technology show in 1994 or 5. And uh, he called me, said, I'm moving. Do you want it? It's like an 80-pound <laughs> giant neon lit sign that says the site. I said, of course I want it. So we got we to gotta figure out how to hang it up in here. But then he said, it's only on loan. When you're done with it, I want you to send it to the Computer History Museum. I said, do they want it? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's historic. I said, okay. <laughs> He's donated a lot of stuff to the Computer oh, History Museum. Actually. Back when MSNBC really was MS MSNBC. That's right. That's why they did it. I was working at Ziff Davis, and uh, they called, and they said, if Microsoft's an investor, they want a daily technology show. Can you guys figure something out? And that's sort of what we proposed. <laughs> Not exactly. Also joining us with a brand new job. I'm so thrilled to have Louise Matsakis here, uh, formerly the Wire of uh, Wired. Not The Wire. Ooh, big difference. Uh, the Wire's in a little bit of trouble. We'll talk about that later. Of Wired Magazine, but also now at a very hot new media startup, Semaphore. Hi, Louise. Hey, thanks for having me back. In your here. fifth day. No, the fifth day of the site, I guess. But uh, I think I've been at the company for, I think, about a month. So, but yeah, we launched on Tuesday. Very exciting. This is um, the uh, media, new media startup by the two Smiths, uh, Ben and what's, the, what's, what's your... Justin. Justin, that's right. Not related. Uh, and it was for a long time kind of stealth. Like we knew that uh, they were starting something, but we didn't know what it was going to be. Uh, and now we know it's, it, what is it? <laughs> I mean, I, it looks like a newspaper, but it's, uh, it's more than that, right? It's, is it tech focused? Uh, no. So we are a new global, global media organization that is kind of taking a slightly different approach. Um, so I think the maybe elevator pitch is a sort of like the FT meets Substack. So we're trying to break sort of global business and uh, politics stories that have, you know, serious impact. Um, but 
We're also doing something interesting with the way that we present the news, we hope. Um, so the idea is sort of to take apart the article. Uh, so every story you read on Semaphore right now, at least we're sort of going to hope to experiment as well. But for now, uh, the stories all have the news and then sort of at the bottom, there is the reporter's opinion and then maybe, you know, just room for disagreement. So like, you know, someone who might disagree or like another way of looking at this issue. Um, and then hopefully, a more global perspective on that story. So uh, in a story I did this week, for example, the it was the view from Shenzhen and it was, you know, interviewing a source on the ground in China about their kind of viewpoint about TikTok's e-commerce strategy. So that's a good example. Like we sort of want to give you uh, a different way to think about the story and also maybe the way that someone in a different place is thinking about that story. So you're going to still focus on tech, but it's not uh, exclusively tech. When I first heard about it, I thought, oh, God, is this going to be another, you know, Breitbart, another right wing? But <laughs> there, there's no political point of view in this, right? No. Yeah. I think uh, the idea is that we kind of want to have maybe some different perspectives. Like there might be someone who's a little bit more moderate or has a, you know, different perspective on this. But a lot of what I'm going to be doing is um, covering China and tech. So uh, I oh, think it's how really interesting. Wow. Yeah, for this story in particular. So yeah. I think uh, a lot of what I'm going to be doing is like, how is this looking from China's perspective? What is sort of maybe what does Africa think of what China is doing or what does Southeast Asia think? So I think that's going to be a lot of I my job. I do have uh, one little mention coming from our chat room. And as they do point this out, that the sun ri currently rises in the east and sets in the west. Your globe is spinning the wrong way at the top. <laughs> Just, oh my god, that's amazing! Just they Thank might you. they might want to. It's a tiny <laughs> little thing, and I'm. Oh, I, that's incredible! But we this is it. our chat room in a nutshell. It totally is. It totally is yeah. backwards. They say, yeah, the sun's rising the wrong way on the. That's easy to fix. It's a. I oh, just yeah. love seeing that. I love the look, honestly. Um, Thanks. Yeah, I think the design is really fun. Yeah. I think it's like, I don't know. It's a little vintage. I think um, the sort of. Uh, it's not a joke, but the like line, I guess, that we have been saying a lot is like, we're not trying to innovate when it comes to like ethics or like the core sort of tenets of journalism. And I think in some way our design is like an homage to that. Um, you know, we may be like trying to do things that are innovative, but like it's a journalism. Like, and is the, is the focus really on the newsletters? Like the hope is you'll subscribe to the newsletters mostly? Uh, yeah. I mean, I definitely think that we want to be, uh, you know, platform neutral to some extent, but we do believe that this is a great way to reach people and to have a direct relationship with your audience. Like you know, yeah. you're not relying on like Twitter or, you know, on like Facebook's algorithm that week. I think it's good to build that relationship and we really want to have that. Like, please tell me if the globe is spinning wrong. You know, like I want to yeah. hear those. Sort of well, this is, <laughs> and we should say this is beta. You don't really, are you, have you fully launched now? Or is this the, the, We've launched, but it's, there's definitely like a lot of work to do yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, we, we're out there now and we want people to sign up, but we're also definitely in a phase of like, we want to experiment. If you think something's not good, like let us know. And we want to be humble about that. I think this is a really interesting trend in, uh, in uh, journalism that was in a way kind of started by Substack and Medium, which is kind of celebrity. I hate to use the word celebrity. Um, uh, revered, respected journalists covering it directly. The byline becomes more important. And I th I think that's completely appropriate. I want to know what Louise Matsakis has to say about uh, these subjects. So I, th I think this is great. And all the other, you've got great people, Reed Albergati and, uh, you know, Liz Hoffman, you've got great people. So I subscribe to Puck as well. And I think that for the same reason, because it was the people that I was subscribing to that I was interested in. So uh, yeah, I'm, th I think that's I'm thrilled. Definitely. Yeah. Because I want to um, hear that perspective. That's what we do, right? You you listen to our shows not because we're we're giving you the news. Ever you know what the news is? We're giving you perspective on the news. Hey, speaking of which, we got Lou Maresca also in hey, the hey, house, hey. principal hey, engineering manager at Microsoft. He is also the hey. host of our uh, Enterprise Tech Show this week in Enterprise Tech. Twyant. and uh, always, always have fun on that show. Always welcome. It's great. It is always great to have you on, Lou. I appreciate it. So a great panel. I was telling uh, them before the show began, I hadn't really put the stories in order, and Louise suggested, we'll just sort them alphabetically. So the, <laughs> the number one story today is American Airlines is trying to stop <laughs> popular... Uh, uh, you know what? It's not a bad way to organize it, right? I don't think it's a bad idea. We'll start with the A's. We'll end with the Y's. YouTube will be the, the last story. 
Why not go through it alphabetically? Why not? Why not? Why not? Actually, I don't know if this matters very much, but uh, apparently there is an app, a third-party app that flight Screen attendants app, yeah. love uh, for American Airlines uh, called the Sequence Decoder. It helps you figure out you know, where you are in the roster and where you're going to be and so forth. I guess it scrapes AA's uh, information. It's not official. American Airlines has been blocking it. <laughs> when you when you get on the plane, uh, it doesn't offer its own version of the app. It has turned down requests from the app's developer to work with him, Jeff Reisberg. Uh, the, he, they have to scrape the data from AA's computer systems. But instead of working with Jeff, AA has... A, A, get it? First in the first uh, in the order has started to protect its websites with bot detection software that makes it nearly impossible to collect the data. They don't they don't want flight attendants to know this. One flight attendant said, according uh, to paddleyourowncanoe.com, which I gather is a site for flight attendants. Uh, one flight attendant said I, that she'd never seen a company go out of their way to make life harder for their workers. Another said on Reddit that uh, the, the app was so much more efficient and easily accessible than American Airlines and own software. <laughs> it's like these companies go out of their way to be adversarial. And there's so many jobs in this world where your schedule is all important and you have no control over it and don't learn what it is until the last moment. And you would think American would either make it easy or cooperate with this guy or, or rip off his ideas. Um, They're yeah. actually suing the points guy who was, as you know, very popular uh, travel uh, website, airline points website. Who He was also scraping data using uh, customers' uh, uh, American and Airlines Advantage accounts. And uh, AA says that's a breach of its terms. And, <laughs> and he's luring customers to break its terms and conditions. So they're in court over this. Uh, it's a shame when companies feel like they have to be adversarial. You cover enterprise technology, Lou. Um, don't companies understand that making your workers and customers happy is the is the right way to run a business. I mean, you think that this these companies are bringing value to American Airlines yeah. and they're doing better than what they're already doing. I mean, I don't understand when they don't have open data policies. You know, this is this doesn't make any sense to me. I think all companies should allow open data policies even if they have to register, they can regulate it and they can offer better value by having third parties do it. I just don't understand it. Well, there you go. There's our AA story. Let's look at uh, what's next. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll pick some. I'll pick some more important stories. Let's talk about Elon Musk. It's a little out of order, uh, but Elon and Twitter apparently have five days to close their deal. The court imposed deadline for coming to an agreement. Remember, Elon, if you haven't been following this, <laughs> offered to buy Twitter, then didn't want to buy Twitter, then offered to buy. Anyway, the last the last thing in this off and on relationship is Elon says, "All right, fine." because he didn't want to go to court, apparently. I'll buy it. Uh, and now uh, he, the court said, all right, we're going to put off the, the, uh, the trial, which was scheduled to begin last week, for one month, but you have to come up with a deal by the 28th. And apparently, uh, right now, even as we speak on a Sunday, uh, Twitter and Musk's people are talking hard. Morgan Stanley stands to lose as much as half a billion dollars on this. They have agreed to fund the uh, the purchase up to $13 billion. But the biggest story is that one way or the other, lots of people are going to be out of work. Twitter has said, we're going to fire 25% of our staff. Elon now has said, I'm going to fire 75% of the staff. Uh, what if this closes, and I imagine they have to get regulatory approval, but if this closes and suddenly Elon Musk is running Twitter, what are the prospects for this company? Harry, what do you think? I should say there's also these stories about the feds being nervous about Elon Musk's role as like a, a global player. He's being and, investigated, right? And, yeah, and a guy who seems to be talking out solutions to the Ukraine war on Twitter and so forth, and uh, who has a close relationship with China because of Tesla. So that's yet another monkey wrench. This came uh, out uh, in the court filings. Twitter said on a filing released on Thursday that uh, Elon Musk is under investigation. It didn't say what the exact focus of the probes was and which federal authorities are conducting them. Um, 
Musk's attorneys provided a privilege log identifying documents to be withheld. The log referenced drafts of a May 13th email to the SEC and a slide presentation to the FTC. So this gets more and more complicated by the minute. Musk says he's going to invite Trump back. Yeah. It's, when, has he officially said that? I mean, he's, he's, yeah, I think he said it was a mistake to kick, kick him off. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if he's quite gone so far as to say, yes, I will invite him back. Uh, you know, I should see if, uh, what the source is for that. But I did see a story that said 75% firings and yes. I'm bringing Trump back. Right. So let me see if I can well, find the source for that. And on the on the 75% fire range, I think he's also told people he plans to hire more people. So given this is Elon Musk, you don't know what's going to happen until it does know, happen. This is crazy. Um, the <laughs> Washington does. Post said that Musk plans to slash Twitter's workforce by 75%. Musk, uh, this was, I guess, in the presentation that he gave to uh, potential investors. So uh, right. when he was looking for funding, uh, Twitter executives themselves say 25%. It does feel like Twitter would probably be fine with fewer people, maybe a lot fewer people. Um, I think even if it could be run well with 75% fewer people would be incredibly bruising for it to happen. And presumably if, if your goal is to keep the 25% who are most important and best, this experience might be sort of traumatic for them. A lot of them will leave too. Uh, and uh, I certainly, the, I, mean, one of the, I mean, one of the primary things I, I'm concerned about is, um, essentially the possibility that Twitter, which actually has made a fair amount of progress in, in terms of, of uh, managing it, so it's a little a little bit harder to be a horrible troll on Twitter than it once was, uh, that they'll lose all that progress they made. Um, and yes, maybe it will be a, a place where free speech flourishes, um, but in a way which will leave anybody trying to be constructive way less inclined to be there, and it will hurt forget, everybody. Forget Trump. Is he going to bring Ye back? That's really what everybody cares about. no i'm not i'm kidding um <laughs> louise you have an opinion uh on all of this yeah i mean i have two things to say i think one harry is really right that uh a lot of this looks to me and feels to me and smells to me like elon trying to find ways to get out of the deal right still so I think, even with him yeah. even with him changing his tune yeah, I, I still I still think that a lot of this, especially when you have really high paid lawyers involved and you have someone like Elon, like I just think who is leaking this information and why is a good question. Um, and then I think on the second front about a potential um, you know, national security investigation, I think that there's, you know, good reason for that. And we shouldn't dismiss that. For example, you know, fairly recently, I think that the story didn't get as much attention as, as it deserved. Um Elon Musk wrote an op-ed in the Cyberspace Administration of China's uh, like quarterly journal. That's literally the <laughs> propaganda department. And he wrote like a nice little article in that journal. Well, um, Elon has to love China. They're a big customer right. for Tesla you know, automobiles. They're even made in China. In fact, I've heard Tesla owners say the best, if you want to get a Model 3, get one made in China. They're much better than the ones made in the U.S., Right. He has a lot of business interests. Like he's not, you know, he said all sorts of stuff about Ukraine, about U.S. politics. And, uh, you know, the only thing we've really gotten him to say about Chinese politics is like, maybe it wouldn't be so bad if like Taiwan and China were reunited. Right. Uh, that's his that, right. <laughs> that's the official CCP position. Right. I think the only thing he's willing to say is that might not make everyone happy. <laughs> like, right? It might cause World War Three, but, uh, you know. Well, just compared to the way he talks so freely about other topics, it's, it's just... It's okay. phenomenal. I mean, it's just phenomenal. Uh, according to Bloomberg, one of the issues in the negotiations with Twitter, Musk wanted to reserve his right to file a fraud lawsuit after the sale goes through over his claims the platform's executives misled him. So maybe that lends some credence to what you're saying, Louise, that he doesn't really want to buy it. This is more just messing around slowing it down perhaps he doesn't want to go one thing he doesn't want to be do is deposed i would imagine right the uh the offer to buy twitter came the day before he was scheduled for depositions uh there may also be uh issues with some of his messages remember in discovery his text messages were released there is some question about the text messages he might have exchanged with mudge peter zatko the whistleblower Twitter executive who uh, was fired and then said Twitter was doing a terrible job and wasn't secure. 
It's a mess. Can you make any sense of this, uh, Lou? You know, I want to I want to talk about the people side of it. I think uh, Harry is right in the one thing that you know I think it might be in the past. Once they have all these deals of talking about firing people, are people are going to run 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 for the hills? Who at, at Twitter point? does and, not have his resume, her resume, ready to right, go? Who wouldn't? Right. I mean, I I think at this point you're not going to keep anybody good. So you know, I, you know, I think it's time to just clean house at this point. Yeah, you know, at least a quarter of you are going to be fired. Uh, maybe three quarters. That's the other question. Is can. Uh, I, I, maybe there's some uh, excess, maybe there's some fat, but firing 75% sounds like you would lose a lot of the uh, security and safety and, yeah. and user safety people. Like I hate to say it, the fat's probably staying. The it's good the fat the that's going to that stay. Leaving. The developers. Yeah, the, the, the people that yeah. are going to leave. They're yeah. the good people, right? The people that are worried about, you know, being at a company that's not going to be run well. So I think that's that's the thing. People who are worried about their jobs are probably going to want to stay to see how long they can keep it, right? Uh, actually, the other thing that... Go ahead. Sorry, I got... I was going to say the other thing that's a little confound, confounding is at the same... Excuse me. <clears throat> at the same time he's doing this, he's talking about how Twitter should be the foundation for an everything app that... Is doesn't just let you send out tweets, but lets you do everything else you want to do on a, a smartphone. Uh, and it's a little hard to resolve that desire with the desire to be 75% smaller staff-wise. Yeah, he thinks he thinks there could be a WeChat-like app in the United States. He wants to call it uh, X. I have to say, some of that may just be more hype about why you should lend me money so I can buy this thing, <laughs> as opposed to something he really thinks can happen. Louise, do you think you could create a WeChat in the U.S.? Uh, probably not. And I think that I've never heard Elon say anything convincing otherwise. Like, of course, like who knows? But, uh, you know, I think a really convincing argument is that Western consumers have credit cards and they learn to use the Internet through their browser. Whereas the whole like concept of a super app is around like, WeChat and Alipay, right? So like you pay through those apps. So once you're like have people's credit card information, it's a little, lot easier to add like doctor's appointments and e-commerce and all of these other things are like, you know, booking a table at a restaurant, right? You can like sort of pile that all on, especially to people who aren't used to opening their browser. But it's like, we have credit cards, we have big banks, like people still like to shop through their browser. So I don't know, I've just never heard Elon like, actually articulate anything in response to those arguments or say like why is now the moment to bring a super app to the u.s right like what would that add i already have uber i already have the amazon right. app like, well we'd have one app right to rule them all uh you know <laughs> yeah, uh, like, amazon's it, not gonna let that happen it, yeah right it, amazon's the one gonna create that not not twitter uh of we've course seen, uh, we've seen meta basically try to turn all those apps into something yeah, resembling yeah, an yeah. everything app, Facebook and Instagram and WeChat. And they oftentimes they tend uh, to launch this stuff, especially on Messenger, and then give up on it after a while because it turns out that people want to use Messenger to message, not to do anything and everything. It's also the case that WeChat grew up in a under a communist regime that had absolute control over the populace. I mean, I think without the government supporting WeChat, I don't know if it's this. I don't know if it, ex it exists. And I should point out there was a, just an article by J.E. Young in uh, the MIT Technology Review, the dark side of WeChat, because it's another. It's a way for the Chinese government to control its citizens. If you get banned from WeChat, good luck doing anything: buying railroad tickets, getting your dry cleaning back. Uh, one reason that it succeeded in China is there aren't any, you know, you don't have Messenger or WhatsApp or Telegram or Signal. They're all blocked. Uh, so, of course, you know, WeChat, if the Chinese government says you're going to use it, that's all there is. And it gives them an interesting degree of control, doesn't it? I mean, There I are think a few other. Sorry, go ahead, Louise. Go ahead, Louise. I was going to say like the ubiquity of um, the payment thing, I really like think can't be underestimated. You know, the you know noodle cart on the corner is going to take WeChat pay, right? Like they're going to take Alipay. Like I think when you just have so much of like commerce flowing through one app, it's really um, that's so much, that's so much power, right? To it's have also useful to the government because many people get all of their news in China from WeChat. 
articles published on WeChat. They're, they're not going through search engines. They're not going to Reddit. They're getting it from WeChat. And that Chinese government has absolute control over it. Um, this is a great article. If you want to really understand why it's something we don't want in the United States. After all, I mean, already we're complaining about how big, big tech is. Sure, we're going to let Elon run every transaction. I don't think it's, I just think it's a non-starter. It's just, and I think Elon knows that. Don't you think that it's just BS? Intended for the investors. Yeah, I mean, it, I think the writing is on the wall. Yeah. I mean, he, he was asking for, what, a 30% discount a couple weeks ago now? So yeah, now, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just, he's already trying to get out nutty. of the deal. It's just not. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we can talk about Blue Sky. This was something Jack Dorsey, it was a little time bomb, actually, yeah. as it turns out, that Jack Dorsey left behind when he left as CEO of Twitter. He had already funded, at, I think, to $15 million uh, of funding, a, a decentralized social network. Blue Sky has now released its protocol. It's open sourced some ideas. It's maybe getting a little closer towards a decentralized Twitter so uh, even though Jack Dorsey said he thought Elon was the only guy who could run Twitter, I think he may have left behind just a little bit of a time bomb. We'll talk about that when we come and then and come back and then we'll get to the B's uh, and the C's and the D's. It's great to have all three of you. Technologizer Harry McCracken, my buddy, wanted to come up. I appreciate that. Uh, we're still shut down in the studios. Uh, we had a couple of cases of COVID last week. So to protect you and your trip to Lisbon. Uh, we're going to thank you, Leo. Keep you at home. Uh, also, Louise Matsakis, great to have you. Brand new job at Semaphore. We'll talk more about that in a, just a little bit. I'm very, ex I'm actually now that I've seen it, very, very excited. We needed something like this. I think it's great. And uh, Lou Maresca, Lou MM from our uh, wonderful show this week in Enterprise Tech. Did you go to it? Did you participate in Ignite? Where, where, did you have some duties? I there? did participate. Yeah, I was excited about a lot of things I was talking about, other than maybe the rebranding of what of, of Office. But other than that, we're good to go. Well, it turns out, according to uh, our experts on Windows Weekly, it wasn't rebranded. <laughs> it's still Office. It's still Office. It's, it's packed still in office. there somewhere. You, you, right? you are on the Office team, right? Yes, I'm on the Excel. I'm, I'm I'm on the Excel team, basically on the Office platform team in Excel, and we were a little surprised by it, actually. Oh, they. Oh, by the way, it's going to be Microsoft yeah, but, you 365. Know, like you said, nothing's changing for us. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think uh, Paul and Mary Joe kind of clarified last week and said, no, that's that's in enterprise. It's not going to. It's it's still going to be Office. That's right. In you just got to go to Microsoft365.com yeah. now, which yeah. is you know a mouthful, but. Oh really? Okay. So here's the story from Throt.com. No. No, Microsoft Office is not going away. <laughs> no, it was uh, kind of a miscommunication. But no, it, it's fine. Yeah, apparently they didn't tell you either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, we'll talk about that too. That's all coming up as we continue this week in tech. Our show today brought to you by my favorite source of audiobooks, audible.com. We've had Audible as a sponsor for more than a decade, I think. And I've been an Audible subscriber since the year 2000, 22 years as a very happy Audible subscriber. Uh, it started because I had a two-hour commute every day, minimum two hours, usually more as, as much as four hours from here to Tech TV back in the uh, early 2000s. And I was just going nuts listening to the radio. When I found Audible, I did, they didn't, at the time, there was no there wasn't even an iPod yet. I had to get a little uh, Audible device. Then I got a Diamond Rio. Remember that? To listen to my audiobooks. Changed my life. Changed my life. Well, now here we are. Fast forward a couple of decades later. Audible has everything you'd ever want. An incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre from bestsellers and new releases, celebrity memoirs, there's mysteries, there's thrillers, there's motivation, there's wellness, there's business, there's more. You'll discover exclusive Audible originals, too. I love sci-fi. They've taken a lot of famous sci-fi novels and turned them into audiobooks. No one had done it before. So Asimov, Heinlein, some of the great classics, audiobooks, and they're wonderfully produced. That's another thing I love about Audible originals. Sometimes these are full cast recordings. For instance, if you, uh, if you love Neil Gaiman's Sandman series, you will love the Sandman audiobooks. There's three volumes now, fully acted out, like 
the best radio play you ever heard. It brings a Sandman to life. It's frankly, it's better than the TV show. It's fantastic. That's just another example of what Audible is doing, I think, to really transform the audio space. You get, as an Audible member, one title a month to keep from the entire catalog, including the latest bestsellers and new releases. You also get access to a growing selection of audio books, Audible originals, and podcasts that are included with your membership. You can listen to all you want and get more added every month. We, we I've started listening to the Fletch series. Cost me nothing. Doesn't count against my subscription. It's just part of my subscription. I love this. You can listen wherever you want in the Audible app, anytime, anywhere, while traveling, working out, walking, doing chores. You decide. Great audio books, great performances, available anytime. It's just wonderful. I want you to try Audible right now. Let Audible help you discover new ways to laugh, to be inspired, to be entertained. New members can try it free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash twit or text twit to 500-500. That's audible.com dot com slash twit or text twit to 500 500 that's great if you want to just put it on your phone they'll send you a link you can install it right there 30 days free audible.com slash twit thank you audible for saving my life all these years i really appreciate it and for your ongoing support of uh, this week in tech audible.com slash twit enjoy it you will <sighs> Actually, I did want to mention, as long as we're talking about podcasts, uh, Pocket Cast has gone open source, which is fantastic. Pod Pocket Cast has gone through a series of owners. They were sold to public radio, right? Uh, and then, let's see, they got sold again. Yep, Automatic. To Automatic. automatic. And Automatic, in fact, we had Matt Mullenweg on uh, Twig a couple of weeks ago, is all about open source. So they've announced that they've open sourced Pocket Casts, which is good for a couple of reasons. One, you can look at the code, but two, you could fork it if you wanted, which is really interesting. I love Matt and I love his philosophy. Uh, Mullenweg said, we believe that podcasting cannot and should not be controlled by Apple and Spotify right on and instead support a diverse ecosystem of third party clients they're using the mozilla public license which means you you can fork it you can you can do whatever you want with it but you must then license it the same way make it open source as well awesome lou it <laughs> i i think a lot of code would be open sourced if the developers were embarrassed <laughs> by the code or more importantly the comments right you you see the code yeah. I mean, the comments are strippable. I mean, you could, there's a semantic tooling that strips all comments out of it. So that's not a problem. If you, you probably went and saw a lot of the old code that's being put on GitHub, that old Microsoft code that, you know, the team went in and added tools to it that basically stripped all the bad comments out. Cause, you know, there's some stuff in there that you want to, don't people say. Comments people write, but, not just, uh, not, not for the public, the old but days, for, yeah. for the other people on yeah. the team and for yourself yeah, to amuse exactly. yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Nobody's going to understand them. <laughs> yeah. But I think, I think you're right. I think most of the time it's, you know, a lot of these companies, they like to like, for instance, this company is putting out just iOS and Android. They have like a barrage of other platforms that they're not putting the code out for, like uh, Windows and Mac and yeah. Alexa and Sonos yeah. and, and Apple Watch and stuff like that. Right? And I think that's yeah. that's their business plan there. Right. So I think they're they're offering two big platforms for for open source so people can can do what they you know, what they want with them. And then they keep kind of their there are other platforms that see a lot of users as well kind of behind the behind the back door but i think opening and developing it open is the biggest thing i think that some companies do what they call opening and developing it develop and open which means they still develop privately but then they like kind of sync their code to the public repos eventually later on and i feel like google does that with chrome so uh so there's a lot of companies that do it that way as well so they still have their kind of like their ip behind the back door you know so to speak I think it's also uh, just, I like seeing the code. I think for somebody, a uh, young yeah. person getting started, like if you're interested oh, yeah, in Swift, absolutely. to see how accomplished professional coders use Swift uh, to make uh, shippable products is great. And it's, you know, it's all there oh, on... Yeah, it's a great uh, way to learn. Yeah. And yeah, it does look like they've stripped comments, by the way. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I don't see a lot of comments in here. So that that's kind of interesting. Um yeah, good on them. 
Good on that. It looks like they're using Ruby as a glue language as well. I noticed a lot of this is Ruby gems. I mean, it's great to learn how people do this stuff, especially a program like this has been around for a long time. So it's really what it's funny that you said that because it's really what brought VBA to being really popular is when they allowed you to record things and then you looked at the code and you actually learn how to code from yeah. the fact that you recorded that thing. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. so it's really learning how to code is a, an important thing from this aspect as well. Yeah. yeah. Automatic is such an interesting portfolio of, of acquisitions it's made. It's made lots and lots of relatively small acquisitions and it's willing to do things with them that great big technology empires probably wouldn't do. And this is a good example. Well, and Matt has said, and he even said it when he was uh, on Twig a couple of weeks ago, that he believes in open source. That, he totally uh, does. He, yeah, he walks the walk. Yeah. They say one of the phrases in the company's uh, mission statement is, I know that open source is the most powerful idea of our generation. And most of automatic stuff is uh, open sourced. Um, I think it's great. You, you agree, Lou? I mean... You write closed code all the time. I don't actually. You I don't? think uh, all of the Office platform stuff is mostly open source. All of our most of our stuff. Really? Office Jet, Office.js, and everything like that. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Uh, obviously, there's proprietary code like client code. Excel is proprietary code. That's closed door stuff. But most of the stuff that, from a platform perspective, we we opened it. Uh, yeah, and that's the answer, by the way. To the there are a lot of calls. Oh, open source Windows. A lot there is a lot of proprietary code that Microsoft licenses, I would imagine, in there, right? So it's not all in your control. Uh, you know, you gotta you can't just willy nilly release code that right you paid for somebody else to use <laughs> so uh, but i i do love i love open source i love seeing that uh that is by the way one of the tenets of blue sky which is uh jack dorsey tweeted this three years ago now twitter is funding a small independent team of up to five open source architects engineers and designers to develop an open and decentralized standard for social media the goal is for twitter to ultimately be a client of this standard this probably is not what Elon wants to do with Twitter. I'm thinking. I don't think so. No. Didn't he? Didn't he text his own brother? Blockchain not possible, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Blue Sky on Tuesday launched a website uh, for its protocol, which they're calling the At Protocol, which is clever. It's not the At sign. It's A T, the At Protocol. Uh, atproto.com. Uh, it's federated, is which is like Mastodon. The idea is anybody can run a server and then right. content from any given server can be followed on any other server. It's connect with anyone on any service using the AT protocol. That's actually a, one of the strengths of, uh, of Mastodon, of the Fediverse. It's GNU Social, the platform. Um, you can, this, I'm not sure exactly how this would work, but an open market of algorithms... Um, I guess the theory being Twitter has an algorithm when you're, when you're watching, there's two ways to watch Twitter right now, the latest tweets or the best tweets. And that's algorithmically chosen. You could choose your own algorithm. And then I think this is the most important portable accounts, the ability to take your account out of one server and put it on another server. So it's, it's out. Uh, I find this one interesting because Activity Pub is another protocol right. that's been out there for a while, and right. and it's a standard. So I don't know why they're creating a new standard rather than just offering to help build out Activity Pub. Uh, so that that's what I find this quite interesting because um, it also is very decentralized. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, and another thing too is you know they've had their protocol the the this particular ATP protocol has been out for a while from Blue Sky since May actually it's been in GitHub open sourced. Um, and it's, there's not a lot of people forking the code and contributing or even looking at the code at this point because of the fact that they think, Hey, why are you creating a new standard? Does this make any sense? Like, why would we use this when there's one been around for a while? So, you know, I, I, I find, I'll, I'll find it interesting to follow up with, uh, with how they're doing in a couple of years. So Mastodon is based on activity pub as well. So anybody right. who's using activity pub for whatever their Twitter clone there's actually uh, an Instagram clone, PixelFed, that uses the same activity pub. They all interoperate. I mean, I think that's fantastic. 
Um, but it hasn't taken off. Notice right. that, you know, Twitter's the 350 million user behemoth in this space, not these other guys. There's also the Liberty Project, which is another attempt to uh, right. decentralize social networking and, and let you have a identity you can take between social networks. Um, I don't. I think maybe it's kind of focusing on other aspects of uh, that challenge rather than trying to turn Twitter into an open algorithm. But um, I mean, there there have been things like this going on for a long time, and intellectually they're really interesting, and obviously nerds are interested. Yeah, <laughs> I still kind of can't quite figure out how any of them go mainstream in, in a way that has any kind of major impact on the way the world works. There is a developer. He was the lead developer at Odeo. He worked at Twitter. He worked on Blue Sky. His name is Rabble. He's going to be on uh, This Week in Google on Wednesday to talk about his new protocol. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, the whole issue to me is... The, you require the network effect to succeed, right? You're not going to yeah. join. Look, I want everybody in my family to use Signal, but until they do, it's useless, right? Until your family and friends are using a particular okay. protocol, uh, his new Twitter client is called Planetary. It's on iOS. Not a lot of people using it yet. I, I just don't... If you don't have a protocol. Can you have a coin, right? Isn't that... Yeah. <laughs> I think people want that new protocol so they can generate value, right? I think that's of... right. <laughs> I think that's right. Is is Blue Sky all tied up in that? You said that there there's blockchain. Is it is it kind of also about crypto? I think. I mean, I think that that's sort of Dorsey's. I think it's a little unclear, right? But that is a big driver. Yeah, he renamed his company uh, Block. Right. Like, I think he's sort of tied up in this. He's a Bitcoin, you know, longtime Bitcoin believer. Um, I don't know if he's been super clear about it, but I think a lot of this space is also sort of about like hype and coolness and marketing. And I think Jack Dorsey has proven, you know, he's see, into that. Sort of see, to me, <laughs> nice to me and, that's yeah. a non-starter immediately. It's like, oh, well, if it's crypto, I'm not going to do it. Is that wrong of me? So. Is that is that because I'm a no. boomer? I think that's okay. I think it's fair to say like you don't want to, you don't think that this needs to be financialized. Like, I think that that's an okay, like, trait that you don't like in this. I do think there is some like optimism and people trying to do new things, but I do think that a lot of these social networking protocols are often wrapped up. Like the Liberty Project is definitely wrapped up sort of in crypto to some extent. And I think the Dorsey's thing is too. Um, they might not be saying that right now when like, you know, the market's really bad, but I think it's not really cool to be doing like a new NFT thing right now. Right. But I think that the oh, it's so uncool. <laughs> <laughs> it's really not the vibe for that right now, you know, like, but I think that they're hoping that, you know, it's a winter, right? It's a season. It's a crypto winter. It's not a crypto forever. Yeah. Actually, uh, CNN has just gotten in a lot of trouble for what some NFT fans call a rug pull. They, uh, they had their own NFTs. They launched last summer. It was called The Vault. On Monday, they announced, eh, we decided it's time to say goodbye to The Vault by CNN, which is pissing off anybody who bought NFTs from The Vault because now, what, they're they're worthless, right? If if you're gonna if you're gonna create a speculative security, <laughs> which I think an NFT is. You better damn well keep it going, or or people are going to be pretty upset. Uh, I bet you that CNN will have lots of company over the next few months yeah, and a couple of years yeah. of, of other folks who jumped on the bandwagon, jumping off of the bandwagon. Uh, a few posters on the uh, Discord channel said they're contacting their lawyers because CNN has done a rug pull, um, leaving people who bought in the NFTs uh with worthless securities. CNN apparently pulled in more than $300,000 from the sale. Now, I think there are still bored apes and, uh, and uh, you know, owls and various <laughs> NFTs out there in the world. Who was the artist who just burned all his art? Uh, saying okay. he's turned it into uh, all of into NFTs. And so Damien Hurst burned a thousand paintings and we'll soon burn more. Uh, that makes me really sad. He released a collection of 10,000 NFTs, each one corresponding to a physical artwork. Buyers can keep the NFT, in which case the painting will be burned, or keep the painting, in which case they'll lose the NFT. <laughs> which would you rather have? 
Depends why wow. you, depends why you bought it. If you bought it because you like the picture, then you probably want the painting. If you bought it because you thought some sucker, I mean, uh, investor would come along and take it off your hands for twice what you paid for it, then you'd probably want the NFT. They were initially priced at two thousand dollars, which is a lot less than uh, apparently Hearst's other paintings have gone for. I just just makes me sad. So crazy. Of course, these are like, these are pretty fungible. <laughs> paintings that look like just a bunch of colored tots. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I like the art either, but uh Oh, that they all looked like that? Yeah, I think so. They're all colored. Oh, okay. oh. I thought they were all different. So okay. is he an artist or I don't know. Well, this is I thought he was burning like his like existing collection, you know, but it's like he made something specific for this project. I feel like that's less of a stunt, you yeah. know what I mean? He made yeah. the postcard. Basically. Yeah. Do you want the postcard or do you want the NFT? Yeah, maybe it's a stunt. <laughs> a lot of a lot of the stuff around this stuff is a stunt. Look, he it worked. <laughs> it worked. He, uh, you know, he's claiming he's burning ten million dollars worth of art. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> maybe it will be worth ten million dollars when it gets turned into an NFT. The stunt is part of the art here. Yeah, the stunt is part of the art. Yeah, and we gave him the uh, we gave him all the attention he wanted. Sorry. Uh, let's see. Alphabetically, <laughs> Android adware apps. These there are sixteen of these apps in the Google Play Store. Nothing you'd probably want to buy, although you might accidentally uh, stumble across currency converter. Image Vault, Joy Code, Flashlight Plus, High Speed Camera, and buy it or download it. Actually, you don't have to buy it. Somebody's doing it. 20 million downloads of these, and they contain a clicker app. Get this. This is an interesting kind of scam. They, uh, they, it, you might not even know that you've got a clicker app on your Android device. It loads ads invisibly. In invisible frames or in the background, and then uh, programmatically clicks on them to generate revenue. So the real people getting ripped off by this are the people who bought the ads in the first place. They're getting charged for invisible clicks. I think this is to some degree the dirty little secret of digital is the fake clicks that some say are as much as half of digital ads. You're paying for the clicks. And half of them are are things like this, fake. All 16 apps are gone. Don't go looking for them. McAfee reported them. <laughs> but that was after 20 million people installed them. The worst, DX Clean. Did you install this? 5 million people did. Rel a positive rating of 4.1 out of 5 stars. I'm not sure why. It was supposedly, a, this is why, because you can't tell if it's really doing anything because it's a system cleaner and optimizer. Hey, it seems to be operating better. In fact, it's not because it's in the background clicking on downloading and clicking on ads. Hmm. It's interesting that these these apps even get into the store, though. I mean, a that's lot of a times, real question. Yeah, how are they get? I mean, don't they notice? I mean, when you even if you're using a web view web browser control, if you know if the code has been scanned by the store to say, oh well, you guys are these are invisible frames that you're you're not supposed to be doing that. You're supposed to only be visible view web views or that kind of thing. Like they should have some level of of you know gates to go through for these types of things. Now, if the app even the app updates itself, it's got to go through the store unless you're allowing them to just build a web app frame. And then you are still kind of limited in what you can do at the operating system level. So I, I feel like. Apple, I mean, not Apple. Google needs to do better job here. If they weren't scanning for the stuff, hopefully they are now. Yeah. Yeah. I also feel like Google has a little bit of a vested interest in uh, kind of uh, maybe not stopping this stuff, right? I mean, who's the, probably the number one beneficiary uh, of this is Google. Uh, they get more, you know, all those fake clicks end up being money in Google's pockets. I don't think Google does everything it can. I don't know. Or Facebook or any any digital seller. Do you think they do everything they can to stop click fraud? Louise? I don't know. Click fraud is a good question. I think click fraud in particular is a problem that is probably underappreciated because I think you're right. Like, what is the incentive? It doesn't create as much of um, bad press. Although, you know, there were two times that Facebook got in a lot of trouble when they, that was a separate issue, but that they had mismeasured 
you know, the actual impact. I think you don't want to, you know, let it go so crazy that the market is so manipulated that everybody sort of knows that, right? But that kind of is where we've gone with click for arms to, to some extent, you know, it, it gets more and more sophisticated. Um, but I think app store approval policies are also sort of a really mysterious and neglected area of reporting. You know, I think we forget how much of content moderation is happening at that level until there's like, you know, a really prominent app that gets yanked. But every day there are just so many approvals and denials for all sorts of apps, you know, for political reasons, for spam reasons that end up getting through or not. Do you think these apps would have gotten through the Apple process? I think the Absolutely. overall reputation is, yeah, that Apple's better, I think. But we get that impression. You you say yes, uh, Lou. Yeah, I mean, they've been through the process. They, they'll, they'll, they take you to the ringer. And the reason why a lot of these rules and policies are not, visible to you is because they do things behind the scenes to make right. sure you're not doing anything wrong and they don't want you to know what those are. Right. Um, we've complained to iHeartMedia. We've bought ads on uh, iHeartMedia podcasts and then we learned <laughs> that they were buying ads in video games where they would show you 10 seconds or make you listen to 10 seconds of a podcast to get the loot box or whatever. And it turns out that counts as a full download of the podcast. So you know, you buy an ad in that podcast, nobody's hearing that ad. You're getting charged for that ad. Uh, but all they did was play 10 seconds in a video game. Uh, that seems a little scummy. <laughs> uh, iHeart has reportedly spent $10 million over the last four years producing about 6 million unique listeners a month from these games. We, uh, we asked them for a comment and a refund and we haven't heard a thing <laughs> no just no no answer at all no answer at all all right we're gonna take a little break apple announced new ipads much to the consternation and confusion of the uh of ipad buyers we'll talk about that and where are new uh m2 macbooks that's coming up louise matsakis is here tell me about semaphore i'm i this was a big deal when Justin and Ben announced this almost, it's almost, it feels like six, seven months ago, right? A while ago. I think even longer than that. Yeah. yeah. I think it was around January and, or something. And they were cagey about it. They didn't say what was, what it was going to be. I think um, it's kind of funny because it's sort of just deceptively simple. So people are like, what do you mean? And it's, it's like, got to be well, more than that. <laughs> well, we're launching a global news platform. And I think people sort of laughed at that, but it's uh, the truth. You know, I think the idea is hopefully to compete with some of the best global news organizations in the world, like Reuters, um, you know, like the Wall Street Journal, like Bloomberg, but hopefully um, do a little bit more to have a more global perspective. Because I think that uh, those publications are sort of designed for a U.S. audience. Um, and we're hoping, you know, for example, like one of the first markets we launched in actually was Sub-Saharan Africa. And wow. uh, the coverage wow. we're doing there is like intended to be, you know, for Africans, um, by Africans. Uh, and I think that is our approach to some extent. But um, yeah, we're breaking down the news article, uh, me and uh, Reid Hoffman. Uh, uh, Reid Albogadi, sorry. <laughs> I'm like... I, I love Reid. Uh, he was at the Washington Post, yes. right? Yeah. He from the Washington Post. He's amazing. So we're writing a newsletter together. Um, oh, and the let me subscribe to that. Look at that. I can just yeah, that please box. do. Yeah. Uh, and so we're writing a newsletter together twice a week. Reed is amazing. Um, he came from the Washington Post where he covered Apple. Uh, he was at the Information for a while. Actually, and I want broken. to subscribe to all of these. <laughs> these are great. Please do. We would love They're that. Great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's the you know most important thing for your readers to know is you know twice a week you can sort of get our scoops on all, all things tech. And I'm going to be covering uh, tech in China in particular. So if you want to understand TikTok, if you want to understand, um, you know, what's going on in Washington with China and tech and with semiconductors and sort of a lot of stuff that's been in the news, uh, it's a good place to just subscribe to. Really interesting. I, you know, you, you, I think there are those who say this is the wrong time to start a news service or a new, you certainly wouldn't want to start a newspaper today. Do people even go to websites anymore? I don't know, to read the news. I, I think they do. I, but I think, you know, as a news organization, you just sort of have to um, think in multiple formats and multiple yeah. platforms. Yeah. I think one thing that we're doing differently is that um, we're doing video from the start. And we're actually, we have a video series right now that is partially animated by AI. Um, so we're really trying to be innovative. Whoa, and I want to see that. Where, where? So where is that? Uh, it should be on our website. And we have 
put out some, we put out the first episode uh, on Twitter as well. It's called Witness. Um, and it's sort of about people who are firsthand witnesses to, you know, the biggest events happening in the news. And we're animating their story with AI, which is really cool. Um, <sighs> so we're trying to be a little bit more innovative. It's not just newsletters, you know, but I think that's a big part of it. I strategy. think that's very interesting. Do, uh, what are they using? Are they using a uh, Dolly 2 or Stable Diffusion or Mid Journey or all three? Do you know? I believe it's stable diffusion, but I think we're, you know, open to experimentation and seeing what works and what doesn't. Um, but I think uh, Dolly 2 right now is just images, I believe. I don't know how Yeah, stable diffusion does, will do animation. Stable right. is an interest. I mean, come back, we can talk a little bit about stable diffusion because there's a little bit of controversy now going on around it. Uh, I think it's kind of created a, a Cambrian explosion of, of uh, AI art, but uh, there are those who say, man, maybe this is not, the greatest thing ever, chiefly the artists whose art has been scraped by stable diffusion. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a bit. Harry McCracken's also here, the technologizer from Fast Company. What have you been covering lately? Uh, what's your latest uh, beat on Fast Company? I have a good gig because it's a little bit of everything. I have um, a couple of stories coming up. I think feel like I feel like most of them I shouldn't talk about yet, but I, I do have a cool story which actually ties in a little bit to TikTok and particularly how Meta is attempting to compete with TikTok and, and Instagram and Facebook um, by not showing you stuff that your friends followed, but showing you stuff that an algorithm says you'll click on, which has caused a lot of consternation. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. That also, will be in our next our next print issue, and also be on the site before too long. Cool. Can't wait. It's funny. You're very. When I search for your name, the first article I get is something from August 2014. My, <laughs> the iPhone event from 2014. Okay. <laughs> you should be able to find a, a scrolling list of all my fast company stories. It, it is, but like. it's in, I think it's in reverse chronological order, maybe. Huh. Huh. I don't know what order it's in. It's interesting. Well, we want you to read everything starting yes. seven. Do read it all. It's all ago. great. It's all great. And from the Microsoft 365 team, Lou Moresca. <laughs> That's right. If, can I start saying that now? Is that... Sure, why not? Why not? It's still We're office. We're going to start saying kids. it, right? Yeah, it's still <laughs> office. What I, so it, I, you don't have to answer this, but it feels like Microsoft is moving away from being the Windows and Office company to being the cloud company. Like Azure is a big part of what they're doing. And I wonder if at some point Office will just be a cloud platform. Um. I don't think so. I mean, my opinion here is, and this is not the company's opinion, obviously, but my opinion here is there's a lot of users, you know, in different sectors of the market that don't want to use a cloud or web version of a product. Yeah. If you're a lawyer uh, writing pleadings yeah. in Microsoft Word, you don't want that to be word for the web. Right. Yeah. Right. That makes sense. So, And that's the big advantage over a lot of these other products that are out there like Quip or Google or whatnot, because you can have an offline version of this application that you can feel like secure on your own device. So. Yeah. I want to ask you about Loop. I don't know if you know anything about Loop. I do. Yeah, I love Loop. I use it oh, every day. Oh, I'm so it jealous. It's not public yet. Uh, I have lots of questions. So do Paul and Mary Jo. To me, I feel like Loop and, and Google's doing something similar. Actually, Google did something similar with Wave, which failed, but they're doing something similar with Google Docs. Uh, Apple, I think, is going to start doing something. They have a new kind of whiteboard app that sounds like a little bit like Loop. Uh, and of course, there's Notion. I think there's a, there's something kind of bubbling under here in a new way of working with documents. I want to ask you about that when we come back. Sure. Uh, but first, a word from our sponsor, Zip Recruiter. Benito, did did we hire you through Zip Recruiter or Jason's friend? So there's two ways to get a job with Twit: be Jason's friend, <laughs> or through Zip Recruiter. So as with any uh, workplace, a lot of the people you hire are people who know somebody who knows somebody, that kind of thing. But uh, that's right, because you, yeah, we, we, did you work with Jason at CNET? That's why, yeah. But when we, for instance, we our beloved continuity person, she handled, uh, wrote the copy, she handled all the advertisers, was great. Ashley decided to go to another company, happens about three months ago. Lisa's going, oh my God, what are we going to do? This is a very important person to the company. What do we do? We went to ZipRecruiter. It's where we always go, to ZipRecruiter, posted the job. Now, one of the great things about posting a ZipRecruiter is you're casting the widest possible net. The thing I always say is a company is made of people. 
your company is is really just a bunch of people working towards the same goal. And hiring a great employee tra can be transformative. It can help you so much. Hiring the wrong employee can put you and put the brakes on big time. And we've had that experience in both directions. So it really becomes important. Your hiring might be the most important thing a company's leadership, a company's HR division does. You're putting together the team that's going to make you or break you. So we take this very seriously. And I think anybody who has a company of any kind, it be a podcast company, but of any kind, should be paying attention to the team you're building. Hiring the right people is so important. And whether you're hiring for a podcast like we are or for your growing business, ZipRecruiter is the place to go. Lisa posted that opening in our continuity department on ZipRecruiter. All of the applicants went into the ZipRecruiter interface. That's another thing she loves. She's not going to get a lot of phone calls or emails. They all go into the ZipRecruiter interface, which means you can easily screen them. They reformat all the resumes so that they're easy to scan through. They also uh, will give you screening questions, yes, no, true, false multiple choice, even essays that you can use to eliminate people who are just not right for the job. But then ZipRecruiter does something pretty amazing. They go out, they have a million current resumes on file because people come to ZipRecruiter looking for work. They go out and look at all those resumes, f compare their skills with the people you're looking for, and then tell you about people who are there who are looking for work, and you get to invite them to apply. And I have to say, when you invite somebody to apply... They're so excited because they're being invited. They're really, they're, they're honored by this. They respond, they do the interview, they come in. It was an amazing experience. Now Viva's on our team. We love her. Thank you, ZipRecruiter. It's one of the reasons four out of the five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. It's an amazing system. So if, if you love the team that puts together Twit, you will love ZipRecruiter. Try it free right now. You need to remember our special URL, ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. ZipRecruiter.com slash T-W-I-T. ZipRecruiter, it is the smartest way to hire. And we have constantly been thrilled by how well it's worked for us. So many of our staff. Really, it, it either is somebody we know or somebody we got to know very well through ZipRecruiter. Ah, Okay. Back to the alphabetical show. We're down to Apple. <laughs> we got American Airlines and Android. Now we're on Apple. Uh, Apple did, uh, I guess, did not surprise anybody. They did not have an event in October. I was sure they were going to have an event in October. I guess it's not too late. They could do something next week, but they haven't invited anybody. Their quarterly results are Thursday. They are releasing. They did announce this week that they're going to release Mac OS Ventura. And iPad OS 16 tomorrow. Uh, they also announced new iPads. And I loved uh, Jason Snell's uh, take. He's not alone. Uh, almost everybody has said, uh, what the hell? J Jason says the iPad's erratic odyssey continues. We'll ask him on Tuesday on uh, Mac Break Weekly about this. But the problem is they now have kind of a weird mishmash of iPads. Uh, in fact, their iPad Pro, which one would think is the top of the line, actually doesn't have some of the features of the 10th generation iPad. <laughs> and the 10th generation iPad doesn't work with the newest pencil and the camera's on the top on the 10th generation, but on the side on the iPad Pro. It very much, in fact, if you go to the um, Apple store and you look, it's very confusing. What is the Apple, what is the iPad Air? How does that fit in to this lineup? It's just a very confusing uh, carousel of models that don't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Uh, Harry, I know y you like your iPad. In fact, you've been in here using an iPad instead of a laptop. Are you confused by this lineup or does it all make sense to you? And are you going to get the new iPad Pro, perhaps more importantly? Uh I'm a little confused. I mean, after having spent more time thinking about it than most people will or should be expected to do, I'm less confused, but it, it is still a really cluttered lineup. I'd say um, one of the big issues is they now have three iPads, which have a screen that's about 11 inches. <laughs> um, the, the new 10th generation one, which is 
It's the successor to the ninth generation one, but because it costs $120 more, the ninth generation one is still on the market. Then you have the iPad Air, which is very similar to the um, 10th generation, except it has a screen that's a little bit better and it has a much better processor. It has the M1. And then there's the 11 inch iPad Pro, which has an even better processor and a few other upgrades. It's one um, better, but the, it's uh, the M2. But the, <laughs> but the look and feel is all basically the same for these these three yeah, iPads. And yeah. I, I think it's at least one iPad at that size. It's uh, more than the world needs. And, and you're right, the 10th um, the, uh, generation iPad has this thing that iPad Pro users have been asking for forever, which is the, the webcam being on, on the landscape. Yeah, because you use it like a laptop. Yeah, As so I think you, most you, pro users do. So the camera, if it's on the side, it's like to your left. You look all shifty-eyed. It's um, weird. Yeah, it, sh it should uh, be on the top. Like, is it on, on, on most laptops? Yeah, so Apple finally added that to this relatively inexpensive iPad, but it also released new iPad Pros that don't have that, maybe because it wasn't quite willing this year to invest in like a completely new design for the, for the iPad Pro. And then, uh, well, the, iP the new iPad has this landscape camera that people have been begging for. Um, they got rid of lightning, um, but they did not allow it to support the second generation Apple Pencil. So you need a dongle to charge your first generation <laughs> iPad Pencil, which still has lightning, which means that That's if, you're out, the weirdest if, you're out, thing. if you're out and about and uh, your pencil dies and you didn't remember to bring a, a cable and an adapter, you're kind of out of luck. I got the, I have the Apple Pencil too, but I long ago, I don't know where I've thrown that adapter uh, because I never thought I'd need it. And now so I need it, right? Yeah, so this, they have this new iPad that's kind of stuck between the old iPad world and the new iPad world in a way that's a little uncomfortable. And you, you've you got to hope that maybe they have stuff planned out for next year where some of this will start to make sense and that they probably will involve pruning the lineup a little bit. Um I could see I why they, they didn't have an event because that's exactly what everybody would have been doing, like scratching Foster, their yeah. heads at this event. Um, and uh, and answer to your question, I, I don't plan to buy this new iPad Pro neither. mainly because no. mainly because it's just not very different. It, yeah. it has a it has an even faster processor than the one I have, but um, lack of of computing muscle has not been an issue. In fact, I, I wish that Apple did more to create software. They really took advantage of these yes. really fast processors. Yes. And and the one cool thing it has is the, the second generation pencil on, on the new iPad Pros has this hover feature where, where if you hold the, pe the pen just above the screen, it can do things like like in Apple's Notes app, you'll, you'll see a preview of, of the color and point tip, which is quite quite handy, but not worth spending a huge amount on, particularly if you kind of feel like maybe next year will be when Apple will do like a, a more significant Apple Pro upgrade. This has been the number one I, complaints, not quite right, but the number one issue with the iPad Pro is you've got all this horsepower and you don't have apps to take advantage of it. Uh, Jason Snell says there's no getting around it. The absence of Apple's Pro Media apps on the iPad Pro is an embarrassment. All those other apps are great, yes, but Apple has had the opportunity to take the lead in defining what the pro app experience should be on one of its platforms, the iPad, and has never seized it. Sounds like you agree, Lou. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I posted this even on social networking. I'm, I'm really disappointed in the fact that, you know, they are not putting forth even in their own apps to some of this horsepower. Now, if you get the iPad 11, one terabyte, you get even more RAM, but that thing's like 14, 1500 bucks, but you have no software to really take advantage of all that RAM. So like, why would people buy it? I don't understand. Yeah. I think uh, Apple was betting big on uh, the stage manager feature, this new multitasking interface, but um, which officially debuts on Monday, and we'll, we'll get to see what the masses think about it. But the people who have been using the betas, uh, I'd say pretty uniformly, at least on Twitter, find it to be like too convoluted and confusing, and um, uh, and it's not even something that'll be turned on by default. So I, I think Apple maybe expected that Stage Manager w would wow people, and so far it does not seem to be wowing much of anybody. It seems to be the reason the iPad OS is delayed. iPhone 16 yes. came out last uh, month is because they couldn't quite get Stage Manager to work. It's going to come out tomorrow on both iPad OS and Mac OS. I used the beta on my iPad Pro and immediately turned it off. It just takes up uh, what is already limited screen space and doesn't behave in any way predictably. It does Stage Manager is pretty... Yeah, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, 
stage manager is pretty cool on an external monitor, but that 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 capability has been delayed even further until later this yes. year. Yes. So so I'm not getting the any the screen, of the, the more, Yeah. The bigger the screen, the more stage manager might kind of make sense. And it, it is nice on an external monitor. It, it, honestly, it's not unusual for Apple to, it happens all the time, come up with uh, a new affordance that no one uses, that just kind of, you know, doesn't go anywhere. And this may, despite all the attention they paid to it, they're trying to do something. And Lou, you, you know, you work at Microsoft. They're trying to do something that Microsoft has had problems with in the past as well, which is to take a desktop interface and move it to a tablet. And famously with, with Windows 8, this was kind of a nightmare hybrid <laughs> desktop tablet. Microsoft backed off by, uh, by 8.1 and then eventually by uh, Windows 10. And actually now it's pretty, it's very usable, but it was difficult at first. It was a struggle at first. Yeah, I mean, that, even for building applications, you know, you have to have this kind of hybrid experience. Um, and, you know, it's tough to get through that whole, especially developer platform side of things. People don't want to build for them because they're not, they're kind of newer platforms. And so that's what this will have a problem with is you're going to have to have, you're going to have to get that critical mass on the platform before you see any value for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think maybe stage manager is not the way to handle a multiple. I, I understand they want to bring desktop like multi window experience to iPad but I don't think stage for me stage manager is a big miss I would just I you know I turn it off immediately and don't ever use it uh, it's just on also it's unpredictable you don't you don't quite know what's going to happen <laughs> and that's the kiss of death in a computing system you, if nothing else you need to be consist have consistent yeah, results right <laughs> otherwise people are just going to go I I'm I'm confused um, all right. The biggest, probably the biggest uh, sleeper announcement of this week was a new Apple TV. And maybe more important than the fact that they're new Apple TVs, that they're dropping the price significantly. This is one of the things that kept the Apple TV from competing well with Roku and the Fire TV was, you know, it was a $200 streaming device. Now it starts at $129. And if you want Ethernet and a little bit of an updated uh, chip experience, one forty nine. That's a lot. That's fifty bucks less. Uh, you get sixty four gigs and Wi Fi only for one twenty nine, which is probably what most people are going to get. Still, like three times more than a Roku, but not two hundred bucks. And one hundred twenty eight gigs for twenty bucks more with an Ethernet port and support for Thread, which is Apple's. Uh, actually, it's Google's interface for home automation but apple's supporting it in their home kit um i don't know is this it's apple's apple famously five years ago said apple tv is just a hobby <laughs> they have not convinced me otherwise even today it just feels like an afterthought louise do you do you cover apple at all do you use apple products at all i don't want to yeah, leave you out phone, but i think uh you know it, this is just all part of a bigger pivot services, right? Like I think they want you to have the Apple TV and they want you to, you know, watch their content. I think uh, a lot of the device experiments that Apple is doing right now are sort of secondary to that, right? They want to make services bigger. They want to make advertising bigger. Oh, that's bigger. interesting. Yeah. My thought is like, I just think they have this weird iPad line because like, they're like, well, we got to put out another device. But I think that they're sort of realizing that people... No, they're hitting that barrier, right? Of like how much they can make the next iPad different from the iPad before that. So they need to differentiate. Yeah, it's barely iPad. different. That's right. Yeah. Uh, they may be having the same problem with Macs. We, it's not unusual for them to announce uh, new MacBooks in November. Of course, the closer you get to the holidays, you know, the more opportunities you miss. Uh, it is expected they will announce M2 MacBook Pros and maybe an M2 Mac Mini. But it won't be this month, I think. Even Mark Gurman says it's probably going to be next month. And maybe, again, by press release, which to me always feels like that's a company that's not really proud of what its, what its next product is. Especially like, Apple, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Apple has a unique ability to get the eyeballs of not just uh, the press, but of users. But within uh, a few hours... Uh, they already had half a million views on their iPad announcement. I mean, people on YouTube, people immediately, in fact, I bet it's more than that now, 
uh, people care. And I think when Apple can have an event, they probably should just because it's it's an hour ad. It's a free ad. Let me just see. Meet the new iPad. Yeah, 8.6 million views in five. Oh, oh, let me stop. I can't play it because they pulled us off of YouTube for playing this. <laughs> I, I, <you> gotta... <laughs> what the hell is that all about? Um, don't pull us off. I didn't play it. I just, it started. It was my, I didn't mean to. Please, Apple, forgive us. We iOS Today played this video, which is a nine-minute ad for the new iPads, right? They played this video and immediately got taken off YouTube. Pulled down. Uh, Mac Break Weekly, I didn't know that, so I put the, I, I, I used this to illustrate the new product. Don't show it. Don't press that button, Benito. And, uh... <laughs> And I got immediately. I got from the editors says, "Oh, you, we, we got pulled down. You got to take it out." So I got. So if you watched, by the way, it's only the YouTube edition of the show. If you subscribe on the podcast, we, you'll get the full version of the show. Because it's my opinion, this is a news show. We're showing Apple promotional. I don't see why they wouldn't want us to put it in there. But I can't get pulled down from YouTube. It takes too long to appeal and get it back up, and it's just not worth the effort. So don't show it. I don't need this. I don't need it. But they got 8.6 million views in the last five days on this. So I guess maybe they don't have to do an event, I guess. One interesting thing about the Apple TV is that the remote has USB-C instead of lightning. Yeah. It might, it might be a tiny bit of evidence that they do, in fact, tend to wind down lightning over the next year or so. Uh, obviously, the big deal would be if they... If they USB-C in an iPhone, but you also still have all those people with AirPods out there that are based on lightning. Um, and uh, that would kind of be the litmus test if, if, if you see AirPods that are USB-C based, which I imagine they might do simultaneously with an iPhone just to simplify people's lives. It is the beginning of the end for lightning, isn't it? In fact, uh, the, I hope e so. the EU has in effect declared it's the beginning of the end for lightning because by next year, not for the iPhone 15, by the end of next year, you can't sell anything that doesn't have a USB-C charging interface. So all of Apple's products will have to be converted by the end of next year. That's probably aligns with what they had already planned to do, I would guess. Apple is also, and this will be interesting to see how people react to this, going to put more ads on the App Store starting next week. They sent an email to developers saying, would you like to buy an ad in the main today tab, which has never had ads before, or in a you might also like section at the bottom of individual app listings in all countries except China. No ads for you, China. Uh, there, The ads will have a blue background and an ad icon. So we'll have to wait and see how much they look like, you know, how clearly they are ads. I guess there, there's a here's an example from Mac Rumors. So you're looking at Travel Day, you're seeing other apps, and then maybe this is an Apple-provided. I bet this is. This is an Apple-provided image because these are fake apps. And then there's Trip Track, and you see it's a blue background instead of the white, and it says Add in a blue button. There, similarly, here's the same ad for Trip Track on the Today page. It says Add Trip Track. Do you, does this do undermine you Apple's... Uh, uh, contention that they don't they don't spy on you they're secure they're private they don't care i think I mean, so every, yeah go ahead louise no i was gonna say every app store is doing this though and i think it, it allows you to to bootstrap your application it's great so for think, developers yeah yeah i'm yeah. sure it makes a big difference i know for podcasts if we get on the editorial part of the you know podcast page doubles the downloads for that episode so it's huge i'm sure for the same thing for apps louise what were you going to say yeah i mean i think that you're seeing this sort of like rise of other big tech companies aside from sort of the ad giants as we like to think of them uh turning to advertising as a really lucrative new revenue stream, right? Amazon is doing this increasingly. Amazon's ad business is now larger than YouTube's. Apple is doing this. Uber announced this week that they are also going to start introducing ads, you know, during your ride. Um, there'll be ads while you're waiting for your ride. Um, and those are going to be based on where you're going and where you're coming from. So I think that uh, these are all businesses that we don't traditionally associate with advertising, but you know, they're all doing it now. And the thing that we've always said, and maybe it's not uh, quite as clear to the general public, is that 
Apple by by kind of banning third party tracking is in a way favoring its own first party tracking. They can say, well, these apps they can't track you, but our apps we can track you. <laughs> we can we can Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon all have first party information that's probably more than sufficient to sell ads. So in a way they they're self dealing a little bit by saying, well, you know. No one else can track you on the iPhone, but don't worry. We we got we got this. Hold my beer. Uh, my my big beef with um, ads in the App Store is not privacy so much as the fact that App Store search is really still marginal or even sometimes downright impossible. terrible. Impossible. Yeah, it can be quite hard terrible. to find the app you're looking for, even if you're searching for its exact name. It may not show up top, and certainly in a lot of cases, you'll, uh, other apps are buying. Um, they app you were looking for. So they show up first. And if you're lucky, like four or five apps down, you might find the app you were looking for in the first place. And if Apple just did a better job of improving the, its core search algorithm, this this wouldn't be so annoying. I wonder how much that affects uh, apps and app developers. The fact that uh, you can't, you can say you can do buy an ad somewhere else for your app, but people can't find it and end up using your competitor. In fact, Florian Muller, who runs the uh, Foss Patents blog, said that exactly he said uh, this is another means of increasing the effective app tax rate forcing developers to buy ads on their own app pages in order to avoid competitors steer, st stealing customers totally uh, people also game the system by the oh, i was searching for procreate on my ipad then you know kind of the defining painting app and there was like another app that was not procreate but they squeezed procreate into the their little text field for the name of their app so that that showed up really high even though it, it has absolutely nothing to do with procreate yeah that's terrible uh and speaking as a user you know you may say well i don't care but as a user this is bad for you because if you're a free app and you're trying to get people to download your app and your app page is loaded with ads for other people's apps and you have to buy that space so that you don't get the competitor's suddenly there's a strong incentive to start charging for your app. You need to make more money now. And uh, that's not good, I think, for the app ecosystem. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the interesting thing is they they try to train you when you build put your app in the app store to do SEO, to be able to say, hey, like this is how you get yourself more people to find you. You put more keywords, you use the right, right keywords or right. so on and so forth. But most apps don't do it right because it's not a very clear, like, like, you know, like they were saying, that it's not a clear algorithm, so it's unfortunate. Apple uh, design chief Evans Hankey is leaving. She uh, took over when Johnny left. Three years later, she's on the way out the door. Uh, that's a big deal because there's no one right now to run Apple's design. And Apple, which was famous for its design for so long... Uh, is sitting without a, um, a VP of uh, industrial design. She will leave, uh, she announced, in the next six months. So I imagine they will find a replacement. But here's an important person. This is somebody who, oops, stop, stop. This is somebody who uh, was, um, you know, Johnny Ives' right hand and certainly understands and, and, and knows Johnny's design uh, ethos. Uh, is that a, is this a big deal? Uh, Harry, for for Apple to lose Evans Hankey so quickly after losing Johnny Ive? Yeah, I mean, particularly given that it's Apple, and I think we're still coming to understand what, what the post-Ive era of Apple design is. I mean, there have been some hints, such as the fact that they they brought out new MacBook Pros that were thicker and heavier. Yes. But had, had old had features ports. people missed. <laughs> yeah, they brought back all the ports. So yes. I, I we, we've seen, I think, in a pretty healthy way, them um, lose some of Johnny Ives' obsessions and whether that, whether they're, you know, which they did basically by undoing past moves. But the, the next question is, once you stop maybe correct correcting past mistakes, how do you like, actively make these products better? And I don't think we've seen enough Apple products yet to um, understand exactly where the company is going, you know, given that the products they're shipping today have been in the works for a long time. And, yeah. and you know, Johnny Ive will have an influence probably on, on every Apple product ever made uh, forever. But I, I am very intrigued by um, signs that um, they won't just be what would Johnny have done as the, the guiding light. And uh, 
with Hanky leaving, it might be even a little bit longer before we, we fully understand what the direction is. I have to say, I mean, it's, I have to say, I've kind of liked the direction since Johnny left. Uh, I don't mind thicker, heavier, better battery life, more ports. That's just more functional. Um, I think Johnny maybe pushed it a little too far in the uh, form over function. Uh, MagSafe is back, which has Yay. pleased a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I think that was our Apple segment. <laughs> Uh, um, there'll be lots more Apple coverage on uh, Tuesday with uh, Mac Break Weekly. In fact, Jason Snell will be back. We'll ask him about uh, about what he uh, thinks of the iPad lineup. He, sa he says it's confusing. I think it sort of is. Well, there's one more kind of related Apple story. Apple uh, was one of the companies, one of the big tech companies, build, bidding for the NFL Sunday ticket. That's still up for grabs. Sunday Ticket is the last NFL property that has not been sewn up contractually through 2030. So all the other stuff is sold. The Sunday Ticket was a uh, DirecTV exclusive. They paid $1.5 billion a year for that. Uh, lost, uh, it's, it is said, a lot of money on it. In fact, towards the end, DirecTV was just giving it away because they couldn't get anybody to pay for it. Uh, now the NFL wants more like 2 to $2.5 billion a year which, of course, eliminated DirecTV from the bidding and really brought in the big tech companies. So Amazon, Disney Plus, and Apple. I imagine uh, Google is probably in there as well. This is a great way to uh, promote your, um, your product. And as you were saying, with Apple caring more about services, uh, you know, this is a way to get people to subscribe to Apple uh, TV. They're to buy an Apple TV and subscribe to Apple TV Plus. Um, the hang-up, apparently, and this is kind of interesting, is over what they can do with the broadcast rights. The NFL is traditionally very restrictive about what the shows, can, what the games can look like, how you broadcast them, what you can do with them. Apple, according to Eddie Q, isn't just interested in being a conduit for broadcast games. Uh, they want to, as they've done with Major League Soccer, create a relationship which allows them to do more with the games. Um, we aren't interested, said Eddie Q this week at a Paley Center for Media panel in uh, New York, we aren't interested in buying sports rights. There's all kinds of capabilities that we're going to be able to do together because we have everything together. And so if I have a great idea, I don't have to think about, oh, okay, well, my contract or the deal of interest will or won't allow this. Uh, NFL does not like <laughs> <laughs> NFL is not going to lie down like Major League Soccer uh, is going to lie down. Lou, are you a football fan? Oh yeah, big one, big one. And I'm, you know, I think I, I know a lot of people work for Amazon. They actually work on Amazon's, you know, streaming sports services. They got and Thursday they really, night football exclusively. They really year. want this. They really they want, want this it. because they yeah. they can support they can support all the tack on services and the experience that they that they want their users to have, and they want people to see that. And so they they're really pushing really hard for this. So I have, you know, I, when I saw that, you, you know, Amazon's Thursday night football. The only way you can get it is by having a, a, a streaming subscription. You have to have an Amazon prime and and stream it right you can't watch it on broadcast television unless it's in a, you're in the get in the market of the game uh so i thought that's gotta hurt ratings yeah. but i guess everybody has an amazon prime account i guess and a fire tv stick i don't know uh they did they went out and they got uh two of the best announcers in the business uh kirk herb street or is it herb kirk street i can never i confuse him <laughs> Uh, and Al Michaels, who's a, a legend right. in the business. And I think they're actually doing a pretty good job. But they also offer like three different ways to watch it. You can watch it with the regular broadcasters. You can watch it with some with like, I don't know. This is the new thing now. The Super Bowl was co-branded with Nickelodeon. And you can watch the Nickelodeon version of the Super Bowl. I can't remember what Amazon who Amazon's doing. It's like Jesus and Miro or somebody doing <laughs> doing the play-by-play. -play. Maybe it's the Peyton brothers, the Manning brothers. And then they have a third version, which I tried to watch, which is the Amazon stats version. Right. The only reason I stopped watching is because everything is a bird's eye view. So they can do all these lines and squiggles uh, during the game of where, where this guy ran and where it's kind of cool, but I wouldn't want to, I, I, I wanted, I wanted the normal shot. I like the close ups and stuff like that. 
Uh, but clearly, they've got a free reign to, do, to play with this a little bit. Plus, the league knows them. Right. So they might have an inside track. Uh, this would be very, very expensive. You think Amazon uh, has has two and a half billion to pay a year? I guess so. I think so. It's in their back pocket. <laughs> I, think so. I think they can <laughs> they can find it somewhere. This is a U.S. only uh, product, by the way. Um, so maybe Apple wants to do it globally. I don't know. I mean, the NFL does have global global uh, ambitions. That's why they have games in London every year. Two to three billion dollars a year, which is a massive increase from what DirecTV was paying. Uh, I think it's going to be really interesting to see what Apple does with Major League Soccer. Soccer's had a hard time uh, getting traction in the U.S. They've got a ten-year deal with MLS, and if if I, I hope they do something more than they do with baseball, Apple does Friday night baseball, and it's just not great. But if they could do something interesting, I mean, four K would be just a starting point, but maybe something graphically more interesting. I don't know. I don't know. It seems like there's opportunities here if the NFL uh, lets them. Louise, Harry, you got anything to say about this or should we move on? Not a thing. Not a word. I'm not a big football person, so I, I am looking at it from a distant objective viewpoint. I did, a big, I did do a big story about um, a few years ago when Twitter was getting very into live broadcasting of sports and that was supposed to change what Twitter was to people and it seems to have had little or no effect on what people wanted Twitter Twitter's to be. Twitter's so, so interesting. They've tried so, to throw so many things against the wall. And at, least Amazon, at least Amazon and Apple people are, are coming to them for live streaming of stuff so it makes more sense. Does is is this Twitter does live audio now, right? And, and Twitter not, Spaces. Twitter Spaces. Is that taking off they're trying to be basically this is this was they saw a block party take off and they said oh, we could do that and then no, of course, clubhouse. Uh, clubhouse not block party clubhouse thank you and then clubhouse where's clubhouse now uh i think nowhere i think you know it was so strange to me how much clubhouse took off and how much people thought live audio was the future because it reminded me of like the worst call in radio show you've ever yes, heard exactly like, not being moderated at all yes. and so like who thought that that was like a good, I don't, I don't know. It was just strange to me. Like you can't not produce content. Like good, good content is a hard thing to do. I think people were just really bored during the pandemic and it was sort of novel at first because like really high profile people were on there and you sort of got them right. unfiltered for a right. minute. Right. I did. So the local uh, radio station, news talk radio station in San Francisco was summarily executed two weeks ago. KGO and there was a dominant station in uh, not just the Bay Area but but nationally and uh, Cumulus which is one of the three big radio companies in America bought them 10 years ago messed them up messed them up messed them up uh, finally they just pulled the plug uh, last week um, and turned it into a sports gambling station <laughs> which is hysterical because Part of the reason they did that, I think, is because uh, there is a proposition on the ballot in California to make sports betting legal, and it is currently uh, losing two to one <laughs> in the polls. So they may have may have switched formats prematurely and improperly. But anyway, that's the only time I ever listened to Twitter Spaces. All the hosts who got laid off said, well, uh, what do we do? Talk radio. Oh, we could do Twitter Spaces. So they did like a three-hour Twitter spaces, which no, you know, a hundred people listen to. And then that was that, uh, it's, it's where talk show hosts go to die. Let's maybe that's what it is. I don't know. Let's take a little break. We have a few more things to talk about with our esteemed panel, the technologizer, Harry McCracken, Lou Maresca from this week in enterprise tech, Louise uh, Matsakis, who is now, I'm so happy tech reporter at semaphore. Great place. I'm, I'm rooting for you. Great to have all three of you on the show today. Our show today brought to you by Shopify. Yeah, Shopify. Are you finding sales sluggish this quarter? Oh, yeah, yeah. Discover Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. Shopify makes it easy to sell to anyone from anywhere. I know this firsthand because my daughter has a Shopify site selling t-shirts she designed. And Shopify makes it so easy to set up a site, to get it working. You're, instantly, you can you know accept payments 
whether you're selling T-shirts or tea bags, you can start selling with Shopify. Join the platform that's simplifying commerce for millions of businesses worldwide. You'll be able to customize your online store to match your brand. She had so much fun doing that, actually. I remember when she was doing it. You'll discover new customers. You'll build the relationships that will keep them coming back. And, and I got to tell you, Shopify covers all the sales channels to successfully grow your business from an in-person point of sale system to an all-in-one e-commerce platform, even on social media platforms like TikTok, Facebook, Instagram. I actually have to ask my son. Yeah, I think he is using Shopify for his site. Thanks to 24-7 support and free on-demand business courses, Shopify is here to help you succeed every step of the way. Every minute, new sellers around the world make their first sale with Shopify. That's really a nice feeling, that first sale. You can do the same thing. Shopify makes it simple for anyone to sell their products anywhere. Whether they're eBooks or earrings, Shopify simplifies starting and running your own successful business. And when you're ready to take your idea to the world, you can with Shopify. Truly global, they're the commerce platform powering millions of businesses down the street and around the globe. I, I think Shopify is is the, the, the most democratizing of sites. Yep, Salt Hank powered by Shopify. Look at that. And he can take Amex, Apple Pay, Diners Club Discover, Meta, Google Pay, MasterCard, PayPal, Venmo, and Visa. There, And you know what? He didn't have to do anything to get that. It all just comes with the Shopify platform. And now Hank's expanding. He's got other things he's going to start selling at Hank's Kitchen. I think that's kind of cool. I didn't even really realize this. Both my kids are using Shopify. Isn't that great? Once your store is live, Shopify makes getting paid simple by instantly accepting every type of payment. Grow your bit. You know, if you can accept Google Pay and Apple Pay, I know when I go and, and I'm shopping for something, if I can do Apple Pay or Amazon Pay or Google Pay, big plus, right? It just makes it so much easier. And there's a sense of trust as well, right? Grow your business anywhere thanks to their endless list of integrations and third party apps, giving you everything you need to customize your business to your needs. Shopify removes the guesswork thanks to built-in tools that help you create, execute, and analyze your online marketing campaigns. Right from the Shopify dashboard, manages orders, shipping, payments. It's your turn now. It's your turn. Try Shopify for free. Start selling anywhere. Sign up for a free trial at shopify.com slash twit. It's all lowercase. Shopify.com slash twit to start selling online today. S-H-O-P-I-F-Y, shopify.com slash twit. It's empowering people all over the world. People like my kids, which is nice because then I don't have to support them. Thank you, Shopify, <laughs> shopify.com slash twit. I didn't even think of uh, the fact both my kids now are uh, Shopify sellers. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. All right, we'll get back to our wonderful panel in just a bit, but we did have a very fun week on Twit, so much fun that we decided to make you a little movie all about it. Watch. Hello, Scott. Hello, Micah. Welcome to the big chair. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. The big ball, actually. Yeah, the big I'm ball. On. I, I have sat <laughs> upon that ball myself, and uh, it's quite the thing. I want to fix his desk. I got to tell you, there's this drawer that just doesn't close yes, right. Yes, and... <laughs> yes. You bang your knee. Yes. <laughs> Previously on Twit. All about Android. We've got Flow's Pixel 7 review. That's the 7 and the 7 Pro. Flow also reviews the Pixel Watch. So you get a full review about this. Mac Break Weekly. So let's talk about these iPads here. They did so much to make this like inexpensive, like $450 tablet into why would you, why on earth would you even consider buying a Windows tablet? This is such a compelling product in so many ways. Security Now. This simple and straightforward yet ineffective mode uh, and method of encryption is known as electronic codebook or ECB. The most famous and clear example of the failure of electronic codebook mode to effectively protect the secrecy of data is the classic demonstration of the image of the Linux penguin. 
And how what do they is, even call that encryption? Exactly. I mean, it, I know <laughs> it's not encryption. Twit. Some assembly required. All right. Before we get back to the show, I want to do a little plug for Club Twit because it's so important to us these days. Maybe you noticed not as many ads. Uh, that's going to get worse over time. Economy's going bad, and ad podcast advertising is uh, is I'm afraid going south. That's why the club. That's why we started the club in the first place, and that's why it's so important to us. And I think it's the best deal in podcasting. So what do you get as a member of Club Twit? You get ad free versions of every show that we do. Every single show, not just shows you can get with ads in it, but shows you can't get as if you're not a member. Hands on Macintosh with Micah Sargent, Paul Thorat's Hands on Windows, the Untitled Linux Show with Jonathan Bennett, the Giz Fizz with Dick T. Bartolo. These are all shows we don't publish publicly. They're only available to club members. They're part of the Twit Plus feed. But there's another reason why you might want to take a look at Twit Club Twit is the Club Twit Discord which is an absolute joy. Uh, if you've not been in there, I think it's so much fun. Every show, of course, has a section, and we have chat just like we do with IRC. We have chat going on <laughs> in the Club Twit uh, section. But we also have sections for beer, for autos, for anything geeks are into, comic books, coding. So it's a really great social... Uh, I think it's the future of social media. And because it's Club Twit members only, there are like-minded people, quality, <laughs> they're full of animated gifts. <laughs> it is a really wonderful place to hang out. So you get ad-free versions of all of our shows. You get shows you can't get anywhere else. You get access to Club Twit. And all of that, how much would you pay? Seven bucks a month. That's all. Just seven bucks a month. And it, But it, it sounds like it's not, not a lot. I People have told us we should charge more. Uh, I wanted to make it accessible and fair to everybody. and uh, But I also, it makes a huge difference to our bottom line. It helps us keep the lights on. So if you're not a member of Club Twit, may I uh, humbly, I guess is the word, humbly entreat you to at least consider it. And it's a great gift for a geek in your life. It's also great for businesses. We have a number of business uh, members. In fact, we just, uh, I think, sold another business subscription uh, really appreciate that. There is a yearly plan, but it doesn't cost any less. It's just seven times twelve. Uh, but just to make so you don't have a charge every month. Um, I really appreciate uh, your your consideration. Twit.tv slash club club twit. Thank you very much for your consideration. Uh, if you are on a Boeing 787, you might want to ask when they've rebooted last. Boeing <laughs> It's a weird a weird thing, but Boeing 787s have to be turned off and on once every 51 days or they will show misleading data to pilots. It's potentially catastrophic if the reboot directive, but it's a computer, right? You you can have the onboard network switches crash. You can have inaccurate data including airspeed, altitude, attitude, engine operating instructions. In addition to that, the stall warning horn and overspeed horn stop working. <laughs> that seems like a bug. Lou, uh, does, that, does that seem like a bug? It seems like a bug. Seems like a bug. The, the, worst, the worst part about this, I know, you know, I used to live next to a guy who worked at Boeing, in fact, on these, on these units, and they go through so much rigor. I can't, I just can't understand how they deliver something like this. They didn't let it sit for 51 days, clearly. I guess not. And you know this, software testing is hard because you Very can't hard. test for every possible thing. And one thing they, I guess, must be a memory leak, right? That doesn't, doesn't, you know, that takes 51 days. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, they in, Now, this is an article from The Register. Uh, the register says, uh, based on the uh, airworthiness directive, the power cycling is needed to prevent stale data from populating the aircraft's systems. That sounds like a layman describing a memory leak to me, right? It's filling up and there's no room for the new data. So you're getting old data because you, you filled up the space. <laughs> uh, can we fix this by not using C++? Is that the simple fix? 
<laughs> it, it's never as easy as that, unfortunately. <laughs> I wish it were. A, a true garbage collected language you wouldn't have to worry about. Use TypeScript, right? That's right. Yes, that's, that's the right. solution. Hey, Blue Sky is TypeScript, right? Is it? <laughs> uh, is it really? Yeah, yeah, yeah TypeScript's yeah. great. TypeScript yeah. is Microsoft's uh, take on Java. On a, 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 is it? Is it purely functional? I think it's functional. Oh yeah, it's yeah. A, it's a, it's a, Turing it supported everything. Yep. How's F sharp doing? That was also the functional version of uh, C sharp. Is that is that doing all right? Still going, still going strong. See if yeah. you have functional, if you have functional software, you don't have this problem. You don't have this problem. You have other problems. You have other issues. <laughs> You you have infinite recursion, you know, but that's, that's another right. that's another problem. Uh, this is the week that hearing aids went over the counter. Uh, easier, faster, and cheaper. You can buy in theory hearing aids, you know, at a drugstore without an audiologist's intervention. Uh, one of the problems with hearing aids, I wear them. Um, I wear resounds before that. I wore Starkey's six thousand dollars, and Medicare doesn't cover it. Uh, insurance doesn't cover it. Six thousand dollars. FDA announced the rule change in August, but it didn't affect, take effect until this week. Now, obviously, if you have profound hearing loss, you probably should go to an audiologist. And it's interesting. There's a guy named Adam Curry. You probably heard of him, the Pod Father, who also he says wears hearing aids. He's dead against this. Yeah, maybe he's working for the Audiology Association of America. I don't know. I'm sure my audiologist doesn't like it either. Uh, but it's very expensive. You have to go to an audiologist. They do a hearing test. They then uh, sell you the hearing aids, which they tune. They fine tune. They have software to fine tune the hearing aids so that they are exactly the curve that your hearing loss uh, shows. But it's a very high price you pay. And you have to go back to the audiologist regularly for tune-ups and to upsell you and so forth. I get emails and, and brochures from my audiologists all the time saying, hey, we got some new hearing aids you're going to really... <laughs> Really like. Uh, White House says a move could save people as much as $3,000. Sony has already unveiled a pair of high-tech hearing aids, uh, very similar to what you'll get in their headsets and earbuds. They can sync with a smartphone app via Bluetooth. You can do a self-fit. Walmart, CVS, Walgreens, Best Buy, and others are all selling over-the-counter hearing aids. Prices ranging from $200 to $1,000 and up. Adam uh, says you're not going to get a, a good experience, and that's going to, in the long run, it's going to scare you away from hearing aids. And that's the biggest problem is that uh, for whatever reason, whether they're too expensive or they don't work well, older folks like me uh, don't use hearing aids, and there's all sorts of issues, including cognitive. I mean, obviously, the first one is your wife gets mad at you. But besides that, <laughs> there's co apparently cognitive decline can occur nice. if, if you don't hear very well. So... Uh, it's it's potentially a big issue. Um, Adam says it's Bose that got this rule. I don't think it's. I mean, maybe Bose stands to benefit. But We've certainly been advocating for a long time for it. I mean, this has yeah. been in the works for years. We we did stories on this maybe four years ago when it was. I first think it's the right thing. It yeah. works. Do you think there's any merit to, to Adam's complaints? Well, we um, I mean, with with eyes, we have reading glasses which you can buy without a prescription, and they certainly serve a purpose. But the fact you can just go into Walgreens and buy reading glasses doesn't mean that people who have more serious eye problems should not be seeing an eye doctor and buying prescription glasses. So That's a good analogy. Like, yeah, it seems like it's maybe a little bit like that and that basic issues can be dealt with with a non-prescription device, but that does not mean that we don't need people who know what they're doing. And uh, if you really have serious vision problems like I do, reading glasses are not going to solve no. them for you. You can't buy the Dina Dells for $5 and expect your eyesight to improve. Um, I, I do have to say, though, this is a big opportunity for big tech, Apple particularly. Um, Samsung phones have for, for the longest time had a hearing test built in. I think iPhones uh, now do, where it's just exactly like the audiologist test they play tones at various frequencies and levels into your ears and you press a button if you can hear it and uh, you press another button if you can't um, and I think they work pretty well it seems to produce the same curve that my audiologist gets I'm sure it's a good thing to have but an audiologist is not a physician and they're not doing an ear nose and throat checkup or anything like that uh, they look in your ear 
<laughs> comment on how much earwax or how little earwax you have and then and then test you. I I feel like we could do a lot of that. I and I actually think Apple with its AirPods is very much looking at at this space. Um, Louise, do you know anybody who wears hearing aids? You too young to know. Anybody. Probably do, but I I can't think of anyone off the top of my head. But I think the reading um, glasses analogy is really perfect for this, and I think we have such um, just a systematically from up and down messed up healthcare system that anything like this that can that's it's a good point. This is kind of a response <laughs> to our crappy health health insurance, isn't it? Yeah. That's definitely part of it. Yeah. And I think just like improving people's senses is such a thing that is like crucial for quality of life. So we should just totally be encouraging this. I also think a lot of older people don't wear hearing aids because there's a stigma. Right. Mm. And exactly right. I, th I think if they're AirPods, there's not a, <laughs> there's definitely not a stigma to having AirPods in your ears. Everywhere I go, people are walking around with AirPods in their ears. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't imply that you're somehow hard of hearing or that you're old. In fact, if anything, you might look a little hipper and younger. So uh, I I, th I th can't really see a negative to this unless you're an audiologist. Then there's some negatives. But again, like a like an optometrist, you still need them for profound loss or a variety of different conditions. I love the idea of, of AirPods getting smarter. It's a form of augmented reality. Totally. No, I think it's really interesting. And I think um, hearing is really interesting. And yeah. what we can do in that realm is cool. So. Yeah. As Dwindle, is, podcast, yeah. As Dwindle is saying in our chat room, you can change people's lives drastically with twenty dollar technology, but until now, we've sold it for six thousand. That's a really good point. That's a real. How many people don't have hearing aids just because they just can't afford it? So I'm, I'm all for this. Um, Kanye West is buying Parlor. Nothing more to say. <laughs> I got, oh, yeah, I got yeah, nothing. Yeah. You see that oh, man, um, <laughs> the bird got um, some statistics, and they their daily active users are sixty thousand, yeah. and it's just really upsetting to think that's not really worth much. That's not yeah, worth acquiring. The Verge's story was they're basically a failing company taking advantage of uh, somebody's mental illness. I think that's unfortunately potentially what's going on here. I do think we are in the age too, though, of sort of the celebrity um, social network owner, which has happened with media for a long time. You know, I think in some ways the media business to some extent is sort of choose your billionaire, right? And Jeff uh, Bezos buying the Washington Post, for instance. Right. Or, you know, uh, uh, South China Morning Post, Alibaba. Um, I can't remember what the billionaire of the LA Times, what their claim to fame is, but the Atlantic is owned by, uh, you know, Laurie Powell jobs. jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So we've seen this um, for a while. So I think it's interesting to see it go into social media now. I mean, he's totally copying Elon, right? He's like, Elon's got a social network. I want one now. Yeah, very much. <laughs> I could do that. Meta has been told you got to sell Giphy, or is it Jiffy? It's Jiffy. 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 <laughs> Not the <laughs> peanut butter. <laughs> the animated uh gifs. GIFs. The GIFs. UK the UK watchdog has said, nope, you can't own it. US government had no problem with it, but the uh, UK says, nope, you can't own it. I think our antitrust regulators are so unsophisticated, my God. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> it's a sad. Yeah. I think it's like I think we made Facebook into an antitrust issue and they're like okay we're doing it now and it's like no we wanted you to like systematically look at the market not not just block anything facebook wanted to buy yeah yeah uh are you ready for an app that will let you speak to your dead long lost loved ones no <laughs> too bad <laughs> too bad you're gonna get it Really good article by Charlotte G. in the uh, MIT Technology Review. Her parents are still alive, but she asked them to uh, submit the four to this four-hour interview you have to do for this California-based company, Hereafter AI. They do four hours with an interviewer, and then your loved ones, whenever you pass, can talk to you, even though you're dead. Uh she now her parents are alive, so this was more of an, an experiment. She says, uh, 
from what I could glean over a dozen conversations with my virtually deceased parents, <laughs> this really will make it easier to keep close to the people you love. She says, so it's an app on your phone. Uh, she says she, she started talking to them. And at first they were kind of tinny sounding and distant because they're, I guess they're sampling your voice uh, as if they were huddled around a phone in prison. But as we chatted, they slowly started to sound more like themselves. Maybe they, maybe it was processing. I don't know. They told me now this is weird, personal stories I'd never heard. I learned about the first and certainly not last time my dad got drunk. Mom talked about getting in trouble for staying out late. Now, I'm curious if the AI is making these up or if they had them in the interview. They gave me life advice and told me things about their childhood as well as my own. It was mesmerizing. I think the lesson is to talk to more to your loved ones while you're still lucky enough yes. to have them around. Um. Yeah. And, but, and also maybe run a camera while you're talking to them. So later go. on, on you have that video. There you go. I did do that with my mom last time I saw her. And I've done that several times. Uh, just have video of her talking about uh, stuff. And it's really, it is really valuable. But apparently there are more than one uh, company uh, that's doing this. Uh, to create a digital replica of someone with a good chance of seeming like a convincingly authentic representation, you need lots of data. Hereafter, AI, whose work starts with subjects when they are still alive, asks them questions for hours. Everything from their earliest memories to their first date to what they believe will happen after they die. Um, initially, they were doing this with a live human, but they're now doing it uh, with uh, a bot. Because <laughs> why? What, what do you need a human for? Um, would, you, would you do this, uh, Louise, with your, with your loved ones? So I think it's kind of interesting because on one hand, it's really creepy, but I also think the history of humanity shows us that worshiping the dead and trying to talk to the dead is very human, right? Like it's a, it's a ritual we've always had that you go and you honor your ancestors and you talk to them to some extent, right? I think it's a little weird that they're now talking back um, or they're, you know, this AI of them is talking back, but I think that there is something really alluring about this that feels really um, sort of core human, but I understand why other people, you know, find it creepy, but other people find, you know, the day of the dead creepy, right. Or like the idea of like having a soul sort of creepy or haunted house is creepy. So I think it's, I think it's almost like a ghost, right. Or, but I think ghosts are like part of human folklore. Yeah. I, you know, it's very black mirror to me. It is totally. And I don't know if I'd be creeped out or not. She says on one occasion, my husband mistook my testing for an actual phone call. When he realized it wasn't, he rolled his eyes as if I were completely deranged. <laughs> Her mom and dad arrived via email attachment. I could communicate with them through the Echo app on a phone or an Amazon Echo device. Uh, when I finally opened the file with my colleagues watching and listening on Zoom, my hands were shaking. I hadn't, because of the lockdown, she hadn't seen her parents in six months. Echo, open hereafter, she said. Would you rather speak with Paul or with Jane? I opted oh for, I know, creepy. I opted for my mom. A voice that was hers, but weirdly stiff and cold spoke. Hello, this is Jane Lee, and I'm happy to tell you about my life. How are you today? I laughed nervously. Um, well, thanks, Mom. How are you? Good. At my end, I'm doing well. At my end? At my end? <laughs> I'm doing well. You sound kind of unnatural. She ignored me and kept on kept on speaking. Ah, there's a podcast, if you're curious. Um, AI Finds Its Voice, the podcast in Machines We Trust, Season 4, Episode 10 from the MIT Technology Review. If you want to actually hear this conversation. I, and it's not the only one. There are many companies now starting to do this. Because we can synthesize the voice. That's easy. Right, Harry? I mean, that's, that's the yeah, simple thing. It's getting better and better. And also the video part is also becoming increasingly doable. And presumably there will be lots of people who do this where you can see Ooh, that gets and hear. Creepy. But I do feel that like, I don't, it's not creepy so much as stupid and, and manipulative on some level. Um, um, I mean, it's basically, all, it, it, this is like a, Eliza, except with a, a fancier interface. It's not, you're not, you're not talking to your relatives. Um, 
they're, I imagine they're not, these conversations are not as sophisticated as they seem. Um, if you have, I think it's wonderful to have four, four hours of your relatives telling you stories, but I don't know whether you need this AI interface to make that useful. Just, yeah. just listen to the recordings. Yeah. Oh, it's very strange. Speaking of uh, passing on, Didi, Dietrich Mateschitz, Austria's richest man, the man who founded Red Bull, has passed away at the age of uh, 78. Uh, he's still got lots of energy, though, I got to tell you. He's, he's still, he uh, founded Red Bull in 1984 with a Thai businessman after discovering the caffeinated beverage eased his jet lag during a trip to Asia. Um, they started selling Red Bull in 1987. By 2020, Red Bull was selling tens of millions every day. Uh, in fact, Katy Perry, when I saw her on Friday, uh, she was wearing a, a beer can bra. I don't know how any other way to describe it. And pretended she was pouring beer. Beer came out of it, except she admitted later it was Red Bull. So she was drinking Diet Red Bull during her concert. Uh, it marks it make markets a variety of Red Bull beverages from cola to co to tonics to cactus fruit infused flavors. Uh, revenue of 6.3 billion euros uh, in 2020. Didi built a personal fortune estimated at 15 billion dollars on Red Bull. So uh, he has passed away. The end of the Red Bull. And that's the end of the show. I like to end with a obituary. I don't know why. Uh, thank you so much uh, for being here. I, all three of you are wonderful. Lou, we'll catch you every Thursday on this week in Enterprise Tech. Yes, Fr Friday, Friday, one thirty p.m. Friday, Friday, one thirty p.m. After time. after I leave on Wednesday, I don't know what happens around here. <laughs> so fr Friday, one p.m. You can watch it live or subscribe. Best thing to do is subscribe in your favorite podcast player, so you get it automatically. This week in Enterprise tech thanks for That's the right. good work you do we really appreciate you on the show oh, we love doing it yeah. we love doing it thank you you're great thanks to louise matsakis too it's great to see you again after all these months or years i it's been a while but i'm really glad to see that you're with semaphore I, this is exciting i've now subscribed to all the newsletters including yours thank you so much leo i really appreciate that yeah. uh, it's been so much fun talking with you yeah. uh yeah just go to semaphore.com and on the right side, you will see the tech newsletter that I'm helping write. I would love your feedback and your thoughts. Um, and we'll be in your inbox twice a week on Wednesdays and Fridays. I like the global focus. I, you know, in the U.S., we just do not get international coverage at all. Uh, oh, it's Yeah. And there's so much going on around the world. This is great, especially Africa, which is really undercovered. Yeah, totally. And I think especially if you're interested in tech, it's like all your favorite companies are doing really interesting things at different parts yeah. of the world. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Really good. I'm. This is great. Thanks so much, Leo. There are no ads. I guess there are ads. There are ads. Okay. There are no <laughs> yeah, ads yet. Ads. There will be <laughs> ads. Yes. There, there are some ads in the newsletter. Um, uh, yes, we do have an advertising business. Um, and is that in the long run? Is that the intent? Is it? going to be I ad supported? Gonna, I think that'll be part of it. So we definitely have sort of a multi, um, you know, multi-revenue stream approach. We have a really great events business already, actually. Oh, that's um, smart. Yeah. There's yeah, big money in Gallup. that. Yeah. Yeah. We've partnered with Gallup and we've had a bunch of events in DC, but we're hoping to sort of bring that model. Um, and I think that eventually there will also be a subscription paid product for sure. Wow. You had an event with Nick Clegg. Now that would have been fascinating. Yeah. And uh, it was super interesting. Yeah. Uh, Okay, cool. The uh, of course the the guy in charge of uh, international relations for Meta. I'm getting a Meta uh, Quest Pro on Wednesday. Ooh. Ooh, exciting! That will be interesting. <laughs> I have 30 days to to return it. We'll unbox it on uh, uh, as soon as it comes, either Tuesday or Wednesday on Twig, and uh, probably on Twig, and uh, maybe I don't know, play around with it. I'll have to figure out if I can stream the experience so that you can see what I'm seeing. Uh, Harry McCracken, the technologizer, global technology editor at Fast Company. Always great to see you, too. Thank you for coming by. Give Thanks my love so much, to Marie. Leo. I will. Your beautiful wife. Here. Yeah, and I'm sorry. You know, maybe uh, COVID will be over the next time. Please, please, please. Ha! <laughs>
Uh, we had uh, we had a listener uh, email tickets at twit.tv saying, I'm coming on Sunday. Mm, yeah, uh -uh. no, no, not yet. No, no, no. Someday. We do, uh, but we love having all three of you. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Louise. Thank you so much, Lou. You guys are fantastic. We do Twit every Sunday, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. You can join us uh, live if you want, live.twit.tv with live audio and video streams. If you're watching live, chat live at irc.twit.tv or in the Club Twit uh, Discord, which is always a great place to hang. After the fact, on-demand ad-supported versions of the show are available at twit.tv, on YouTube, and of course, subscription. In fact, that's the best way to do it. Just go to your favorite podcast client. Use Pocket Cast. They're open source now. They're, that's actually my favorite, and I think they're the number... Two after iTunes, the number two way people subscribe to us. Uh, do leave us a review if you haven't yet. Five stars would be much appreciated. After 18 years podcasting, I think there are probably a few people who have forgotten <laughs> to what exists. Remind them if you would. And we will see you next Sunday. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Another twit is in the can. This is bye bye. Amazing.